You're listening to Flaunt. Find your sparkle and create a life you love after infidelity or betrayal. Have you been betrayed by life, your body, or someone that you love? You're not alone. No matter what you've been through, Naked Self-Worth helps you regain confidence, joy, and enthusiasm so you can create a life you love and flourish. Tune in weekly and learn how. One of the hardest things about finding out that your partner has had an affair is the shame and embarrassment talking about it because it makes you feel like you did something wrong, that somehow you weren't good enough and that you didn't keep them happy. And there's such a misperception in the world around what affairs are like and what it means when somebody has had an affair. That's why I have created a monthly support group for women who have been betrayed by their partner. It's for women who are really ready to move through the grief and the pain in a healthful way so they can claim what's possible for them on the other side of infidelity and betrayal as quickly and as healthfully as possible. And part of that is having community, having community with people who are positive. There are so many online support groups where everybody's just really negative and grouchy and they just vent their own pain and they vomit their pain all over you. And this group is nothing like this. This group is honest. Yes, we're honest. But it's also about support and community and holding each other and building each other up. If this sounds like something that you would be interested in, go to www.flourish after infidelity and sign up. When you sign up, you'll immediately get the Zoom link to our next meeting, and then you will be in the loop and you will know when each monthly meeting is about to occur. I really look forward to having you there, to building this community of strong women together. Once again, it's www.flourishafterinfidelity.com. And we'll see you at our next meeting. Hello, and welcome to Flaunt. Find your sparkle and create a life you love after infidelity or betrayal. I'm Laura Cheadle, and today's guest is Barbara Hewson. You may know her as Barbara Stanny. She is an incredible author, and she helps women really get a handle on money. And not only just money, but power. Because isn't that truly what it's all about? The power to know ourselves, to to guide ourselves and our lives, and to do what we inside know that we are capable of doing. So with that, welcome to the show, Barbara. I can't wait to hear your wisdom. Thank you, Laura. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. One of the things that my women say to me quite often is, oh my gosh, I've just found out that my husband's cheated on me. I've got to figure myself out. I've got to figure the kids out. I may have sacrificed my career. I don't have time to figure out money. How, how do I do all of this? These bad things happen and I'm so overwhelmed. What do you say and how can you help them? Really? That's where we're starting. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know you have, you know, a background that you had a, a bad thing happen to you too. And you felt that overwhelm as well. So you can really relate to them. Oh my God. Yeah. I've had two marriages fall apart from betrayal. Yes. So I, I get it. And the thing is when you're having, when you're having that kind of crisis, that kind of relationship fall apart, it's really hard to focus on money. I have to say, because if money, if the crisis isn't about money, if it's about the betrayal, the hurt, the pain, the emotional pain, you, you need time to let yourself heal. So I say, just take a break. But, but I will give you three steps. This is what I did. This is what I did when my life fell apart. And I knew I had to get smart about money because my life fell apart because my first husband was a compulsive gambler and he lost all almost all my inheritance. And finally, after 15 years, after we got a divorce, 
I got tax bills for way over a million dollars, almost two million. For back taxes, he didn't pay for legal deals he got us in. And I didn't have anywhere close to a million, not even close. And my ex had left the country and my father wouldn't lend me the money. So, and I had three daughters young, one was a baby. So I had to get smart because I did not want to raise those girls on the street, but I did not have the bandwidth. I did not have the energy to throw myself in. And I tried to read about money and my eyes would glaze over it. But here's what I did. And here's what anybody can do. Because really getting smart or smarter about money is, is just, it's small steps. It's tiny, tiny, small steps. You do these three things for three, four months and you will be amazed. You will be amazed. Okay, step one, you ready? I am so ready. Okay, Laura. Step one, every day, read something about money just for a minute or two. That's the key, just for a minute. Even if it's just opening the business section of the paper and perusing the headlines, or you're standing in line at the market and you take money magazine instead of people and just leap through it. Or you're going to bed at night, you have a finance book and you read one paragraph. I call it the osmosis school of learning because it's it's really, it's getting, it's familiarizing yourself with the jargon, with the current trends. So every day read something about money just for a minute or two. Every week have a conversation about money, especially with someone that knows more than you. And this is what I did. Everybody that I'd meet who was at all smart or knowledgeable about money, I would say to them, can I ask you some questions? Can I pick your brain? This is really something I'm really interested in. And, and I think, I mean, when's the last time you sat down with a girlfriend or a colleague or a family member and, and talk about money? We, we don't do it. We'll moan and groan and complain, but we don't. So ask them things like, how did you get smart? What advice do you have me for me? What is, what's the best advice anyone gave you? What's the biggest mistake you made? What's the smartest thing you did? Ask questions like that. And people are really, really so good about helping. So every day read, every week talk, and every month save automatically. It's just It's mindless saving. You automate, you have your bank, you call up your bank or you go online, you have them automate money transferred from your checking account or your paycheck to a savings account in small amounts. You start small, you start small, small amounts because small amounts add up over time really quickly. So every day read, every week talk, every month save. In four months, come back to me and let me know. <laughs> it makes a difference. Yeah, I love that. And that is so doable because you're right. That gives you the time to process some of the emotions, to think about you know, what, what do I need for me? What do I need for my healing? What do my kids need? And it's, it's not, I have to figure out how to invest. I have to figure out the stock market. I have to figure it's, it's none of that. It's just mm -hmm. little small steps. In fact, when you are in midst of a crisis, uh, a breakup, a betrayal, don't make any decisions. Don't make any decisions that you can't act on in the next three minutes. You know, it's a, not a good time to make a decision. It's a good time to heal, good time to process, good time to learn, but don't make any big decisions. Such good advice. Such good. Uh, on my betrayal recovery toolkit, my number one thing is stop. <laughs> so I love that you said that because you can't, you can't think past your next in-breath and your next exhalation sometimes, let alone figure out if you should sell this house, rent, invest, get a new job, go back to school, or what? 100%, 100%. And what happens is when you too try to make any kind of big decision, it's usually not a good decision. It usually will come back to bite you. And so, yeah, I 100% agree. Yeah. Now, what about... Sometimes the feelings of shame that come up that I let my husband control the finances or I never educated myself. What, what about some of that shame or that guilt that women sometimes have around not understanding money? Oh my God. So 
for 15 years. I'm married for 15 years to my first husband. I find out very early he's a compulsive gambler. For 15 years, I let him manage the money. <laughs> I did, because that's how scared and intimidated it was. Yes, there's a lot of shame, but I'll tell you something about money. It's not that it's just the shame around money, but money amplifies money problems, amplify the shame you already have. Yeah. So not only do you have the, the embarrassment about not taking charge of your money, but here's the thing. If you're like me, nobody encouraged me to take, to take charge of my money. Nobody taught me. Nobody educated me. It's like I have since gone back in my head and forgiven myself, really forgiven myself. And that's, that's something at some point you will want to do too. Uh, but yeah, it does. It and it's what it says. What it says to me: it's time to work on the shame. It's not just healing the heartbreak, but it's healing the shame you have been living with with so many years. So right now, after betrayal is comes the healing, and then comes the action. Mm -hmm. I love that healing first, action second, and then as you're healing, I, I like that you can just kind of start perusing some thoughts about money. I like how you said, just read something small, just for a minute. Just for a minute. Yeah. Let it soak in. Let it yeah. soak in. Yeah. yeah. And then in my experience, both personally in my own infidelity journey and with the women that I work with, there's a lot of stuff around power. And there's also a lot of stuff around money and power and what we let happen and what we deserve. And that power and that self-worth, what do you suggest women do to start stepping in to that power, to start owning their worth so they even internally start feeling capable and deserving of dealing with money? First of all, let me say that one of the things, so I have written seven books on the subject of women and money and power. Yes, And I realized in my very first book that it is women's fear of or ambivalence about power that keeps us from being financially responsible, financially savvy. And I remember asking a psychologist one time, why are women so afraid of their power? And she said to me something that gave me full body chills. She said, because powerful women have been burned at the stake. And I think that we have in our collective unconscious, these epigenetic memories of the consequences our ancestors paid and the punishment they received for being powerful. But we are at a time in our history, our personal history and our global history, when we are required, when it is more important than ever that we step up to the plate and into our power but I think we don't understand power from a feminine perspective. So my definition of a powerful woman is someone who knows who she is, who knows what she wants and expresses that in the world unapologetically. So essentially our fear of power is our fear of becoming fully who we are meant to be, but instead we water ourselves down so we don't make waves. The first step in, in claiming your power is really internal work. It's really getting to know who you are and what you want. And it starts with what I call the power question. And it's a question very few women ask themselves. But the best time to ask yourself this not the easiest, but the best time is, a, is, is after a separation, after the, when you're in a crisis. This is the time to, is to ask yourself, and the power question is, what do I want? Not what does my ex want? Not what does my parents want? Not what do my children want? Not what does society want? But what do I want? And spend time meditating on that, taking it in, journaling. What do I want? Because for many of us, for me, that was wiped out. That was just, it was like obliterated. 
It wasn't what I want. It was what my parents wanted. It was what my husbands wanted. It was what my children I thought wanted. And I think it's time we take our power back and start asking, what do I want? The second step is support from like-minded people who will cheer us on, who will say, you can do this, you go girl, who can say, I mean, that's why you are provide this and you and your, your women, you provide this. That's why you're so important. You cannot go through this alone. I think for men, power is power over. For women, power is power with. And it is by getting support, by honoring our truth and getting support that we start stepping into our power. Yeah. Oh, I love that. I couldn't agree more. And I love that power with, because that is, that is also the thing in a crisis, we feel isolated. We feel completely alone. And once we start talking about it, we realize whether it's the similar type of crisis, whether it's infidelity or whether it's, you know, something like the gambling addiction or any number of things, we're not alone. We're all afraid. We all have cultural conditioning. We all want some different things, but I love that. It's the arms around each other, raising each other up, saying, you do this, you do you, you do you. And together we all rise. Mm. Yeah. I love the way you put that. I love the way you put that, Laura. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I love that. One of the things that I also really appreciate about your work um, in the book, you mentioned your books, but one of my favorites is Sacred Success. And mm -hmm. I've got the book in front of me for people who are just listening, but there's notes, there's tabs in it. And just the whole concept that success is sacred. Power is sacred. It's not that masculinized version that you said power over I'm going to come in and I'm going to hurt and I'm going to oppress and me, 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 me. It's sacred and it's beautiful. And I'd love to talk a little bit more about that, about shifting the mindset that money is power and money is success and, and it's sacred. It's good. So here's the thing. I'm just going to change one thing. Money is not power. In my relationship with my husband, my first husband, I had the money, but he had the power because I let him make all the decisions. So money ah. is not power. Knowledge of money and our willingness to, to express what we want <laughs> unapologetically, that's power. I love that. Thank you. Yes, you're welcome. So that didn't answer your question. The question, what was the question? It was around the sacredness. Oh, How do sacredness. we shift our mindset to realize it's not the masculine power over. It's a sacred, cohesive money brings about joy in that it's it is sacred that we're not we're not doing something bad by having money. Oh, religion, church dogma has done such a number on so many of us to make money bad. It's just a way to keep us subservient and powerless. Okay, but enough said about that. So let me just tell you how I discovered this for myself. Yes. So I had, um, my first book was Prince Charming Isn't Coming, How Women Get Smart About Money. And I interviewed all these women who were smart about money because my life was a mess. And from those interviews, I got really smart about money. And I wrote that book. And, and then my next book, because I was really got smart about money, but I uh, couldn't make it. I was an under earner, chronic under earner. So I started interviewing women who made six and seven figures. And I started making six figures before I even finished that book, Secrets of Six Figure Women. And then I wanted to see if I could teach others what I was learning. And I wrote my next book, Overcoming Under Earning. And so one night after Overcoming Under Earning came out, that book, I woke up in the middle of the night. I was making six figures consistently and suddenly I had a new goal it was uh make millions help millions and give millions and that was my goal and that's what I was going to do I was going to I knew how I was going to do it I was going to interview women who made millions and that would be my next book well three years later I had interviewed I don't know maybe 60 70 women who made millions no trouble finding them 
but I was nowhere near making millions. I was burnt out. I was exhausted. And I was probably, it was this year 2009, having the worst year I ever had. Mm -hmm. And I was talking to a coach and she said, Barbara, you're too into doing. You need time for just being. I, I knew she was right. So I took, I, I made reservations at, at a little hotel about two hours away. I took my transcripts from all those interviews. And I wanted to see what I was missing because I just had such a strong feeling there was something in there that I was missing for me personally. And I saw it during those four days, reading those interviews, I saw what I missed. I had been so dazzled by these women's outrageous success and my consuming desire to replicate it that I suddenly saw it wasn't that they were making that amount of money. It was how they were doing it. They were playing a very different game than what the world models. And I call this game sacred success. And sacred success, my definition is pursuing your soul's purpose for your own bliss and the benefit of others while being richly rewarded. And here's the thing about, there's what I call the paradox of sacred success. So let me just back up a little. There's three yes. levels. There's three levels of financial development. There's survival, stability, and affluence. Survival is not enough. Stability is just enough. And affluence is more than enough. Now to okay. go from survival to stability, from not enough to just enough, you have to have a problem. You have to want to make money. Money's a good thing. You love money. Great. But in order to go from stability to affluence, here's the paradox. You must give up profit as your primary goal. You still intend to make a profit. You still intend to make money. You still intend to do well. But profit is no longer the primary goal of sacred success. The primary goal is greatness. And I define greatness, paraphrasing a, a, a quote, by Fred Buchner. Greatness is that place where your deep gladness, doing what you are put on this earth to do, meets the world's deep hunger. And that, that is what I learned from these women who were achieving the outrageous success, is they, what their primary goal was, is achieving greatness, doing what they were born to do, love to do, while Helping the world beat hunger. Wow. That's that's goosebump moments right yeah. there. Yeah. 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 Oh, but, that is so exciting. And I'm thinking, you know, putting some of the, the principles from all of your work together for the women listening to this show. Many of them are being launched into kind of a survival mode after infidelity. Oh, yeah. And I think it's nice to have those levels and to understand, okay, I might be dropping back into survival mode, but I will build stability and I will build affluence, not by clawing and climbing and doing necessarily, but also by connecting to my heart and by uh, serving. Exactly. Beautiful. I believe that for women, Financial success is far more than a practical process. It is a spiritual practice. It is a healing journey. It is a transformational experience. It is more important, the inner work. If, when we can really do the internal healing, that is what will speed up our, our, our learning curve. That will, have, will take us through those three and not everybody wants affluence. Not I, I. Not everybody does. But just True. reaching stability when you have enough, that's fine too. But yeah, it is. It is a spiritual practice. It is a healing journey. It is a transformational experience. It's because here it is. It's not the money. It's who you have to become to be a container that can attract, that can grow, and that can keep your wealth. 
And that's what this work is. Yeah. So, so, so spot on. Now, whether we call it a transformational journey or a healing journey, it is a journey. And on all journeys, we have ups and we have downs and we have successes and we have failures. What wisdom do you have that can help people navigate that journey? There is no such thing. There's no such thing as a failure. There's just no such thing. It's just a mistake that you can learn from. It's a mistake you can learn from. And if you can stop seeing it as a failure, which automatically shuts you down, and you go into this fight, fight, or flee, freeze mode. But if you can see it as, oh, that's a mistake. I, my, one of my father never gave me any advice about money. Never. Whenever I would ask him, he'd always say, "Don't worry." But one time, uh, I said, "Come on, Dad. I really got to get my financial act together." He didn't think women should make or manage money. But anyway, I said, "What do I do?" He said, "Make lots of mistakes." I said, "Really?" That's what you got for me? He said, yeah, that's where you learn. You make your mistakes, but you don't put so much in any one investment or in any one deal or any one thing that if you lose it, it will take you under. So yeah, don't be afraid of making mistakes. So I, but I don't think I completely answered your question, but I got so triggered by the failure. (laughs) No, but that is so good. I, I think that does answer because, you know, the question was, how do you navigate it? And I think how you navigate it is by that reframe. It's not, I'm a failure. It's not, I can never do this. I'm stupid, blah, 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 blah. It's yay. I made another mistake. Now I know. Now I know more. Yeah. The words you use, especially the words you use to yourself. If you wouldn't use those same words to your kids, cut it out. Stop it. Because your words shape your reality. You say things over and over again. You start programming your brain to believe that's true and then your brain will not do or say or hear or act on anything that it doesn't believe is true so it's important like I keep affirmations are very powerful I keep by my desk a post-it note because my big thing is oh I don't think I can handle this oh I I don't think I, I don't have what it takes that's mine kind of thing so I have this post-it note right here. And he says, I can handle this. So every time I find myself getting scared, I just look at my post-it note. I can handle this. And when you say the words and you put feeling attached to it, it's very powerful. It's very powerful. Yeah, it is. I've got a poster right next to my desk too, for the same thing. And, and mine is dream big. And that's Uh, not quite an affirmation, but what I say inside when I see my dream big is this is fun, Laura. How big can you dream, Laura? Who can you help to? It's like, yes, you can dream big. So you're absolutely right. It's it's inspirational. And the emotion does carry it to that next level because I know I can do anything now. Mm-hmm. Now, just the title of your book, Prince Charming Isn't Coming. And, you know, some of the stories you've shared, I think that a lot of women kind of resonate with that, that I've been through this difficult time and now I'm going to find love again. And even though maybe I have to navigate these single years on my own or deal with finances for a few years on my own, someday I'm going to find love again. And then he will take care of everything for me. This is just temporary. Yeah, that's so sad. That's so yeah. sad. I felt that way for years until I realized I can have my Prince Jeremy, but he's no longer my savior. He's no longer my rescuer. That's my job. That's where I got to take my power back, but he's my partner. And when I came to that decision, I found the most amazing husband. We've been together for 14 years. Oh my God, he's like phenomenal. But I had to get to that place where I was sick and tired of being ignorant, of being dependent. I really wanted to take my power back. I really did. And I would just, there is, I remember when I first sold my book, my that Prince Charming book, 
to, yeah. to Penguin. And I remember I went to New York and had uh, lunch with my editor, we, we met. And we were talking and I said, do you invest? And she said, oh no, oh no, 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 I, I don't invest. Oh no, 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 no. And I could tell she was embarrassed. She says, I have no money, I don't have any money. And I said, okay, we dropped it. And so a year went by, I wrote my book. Another year went by and I get a call from her two years later after my book comes out. And she goes, I have to tell you, Barbara, when we had lunch that day, I had money in my 401k, but it was all sitting in cash. And my brother, who's an investment banker, told me how dumb that was, but it was too scary for me. But I worked on your book and I realized, no, I need to start investing. I need to start learning. So she got fully invested in her 401k and she even started investing outside her 401k. And then she said to me, I was so excited. I was so happy for her. But then she said to me, what I hear every woman say when they really start taking charge of their money. She said to me, I have to tell you, Barbara, I feel so powerful. And that's why we do this. It's not about how much money you have in the bank. It's about who you have to become and how you feel about yourself. When you go through that, those scary steps of trying to take charge, and then one day you start understanding, and one day it starts making sense, and one day you, oh my God, this stuff is even firm. And that's how it works. That's amazing. And as you were saying this, I, I was writing down several words because there's some intersections here. Who you have to become. How many people, how many women think they have to become manly to deal with money or that they have to be alone forever? And you are such a perfect example. You are feminine. You are beautiful. You have a happy, healthy, loving relationship. You, are, you don't have to be a man to deal with money. You can be a woman and deal powerfully with money and still be in a relationship where you're not dependent, where you're both powerful and it works so much better. It works really good. It works really good. In fact, I don't know why I want to say this, but there, there are two resources that I would love to tell your women about. Please. If anyone's interested in getting smart about money or smarter, because it never ends, one resource that I love, subscribe to this newsletter, Elvest, E-L-L-E-B-E-S-T. It's free. Elvest is a financial firm that is run by women for women. And they their newsletter and everything they put out in all their courses are all geared to women, the way women think, and the way women talk. I highly recommend that, highly. The second, the second resource is called Her Money, H-E-R-M-O-N-E-Y, one word. Okay. It, they have a newsletter. They have programs. It's a free newsletter. Absolutely subscribe to that. Oh. Absolutely. It is written for women by women. So I just start with that. Just oh. Thank and you're you. going to you're going to see women and men do handle money differently, do talk about money differently, and when you can be around money around women. And also, can I just put in a plug for what something I have? So Absolutely. About four, about four or five years ago, well, it's been my dream forever since I, I've been doing this for for thirty years, almost thirty years now. I've been empowering women around money for thirty years. Yeah. And it was always my dream to have a safe space where we could talk about money openly, candidly, vulnerably as women. So I have uh, an online community. It's a beautiful, loving, close-knit community called The Wealth Connection. And we do, we, we talk, we talk about money. We have experts come in and teach about money. We have a financial book club. We have all kinds of cool things. Oh, I love and, that. And, and what it is, I believe that financial success is a four-pronged process. It's the outer work, the inner work, the higher work, and the deeper work of wealth. The outer work is the practical. And that's, mm -hmm. that's where most people are at. But when you have trouble with the practical, like I did, it's important that you go to the inner work of wealth, which is the emotional, psychological. It's important that 
Honestly, because we women, once we are financially stable, we are rarely motivated by money. What motivates us is the opportunity to help others, to you know make a difference in our families, in our communities. And that's what the higher work of wealth about. The higher work is the spiritual, to use money, to use your security to do what you're here to do. And then there's the deeper work, which is the mind-brain connection, the neuroscience of it. And so that's where we focus on all four of those in my in the wealth connection. Oh, I love that. I don't know why I am not in your community. So <laughs> <laughs> oh, that would be so cute. And and we've made it really affordable. It's only $47 a month. Oh, perfect. And so check it out. You can go to my website, Barbara dash Houston.com, H-U-S-O-N, and just check it out. See if it works for you. Yeah. And I will put that in the show notes too. Oh, thank you. Okay. Yeah. And I'm thinking that's also a perfect way. You know, you were talking about these steps, read a little bit about money. That's something where you can kind of dabble. You can get some information. You can read a little, you can talk a little, and you can just check it out. And I, and, and, and what, what is so important, and this is a component of support, is but having role models. That's what my interviews did for me with these women who were smart and successful. They became my role models. And and what happens in, in when you're in a group, when you're in people and you see success and you see how they came from where you were to where they are, it just shows you, yeah, it's possible. It's really phenomenal. Yeah. And what I appreciate about that too, not only is it possible, but it's fun. Because so many of the people that I work with have this idea like, I can do it and it's going to be awful and I'll be away from my kids forever and I'm going to sacrifice. That could be fun. You can really help the world and change uh, change the world and help other people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's powerful. Something else you had said is it's too scary. You know, you were talking about your editor and she said it's too scary to invest. What causes that feeling that it's too scary? And how can we get over that? Ignorance creates fear. Whenever you don't understand something, it's scary. I remember before I had my first child, I was terrified. I didn't know anything about raising babies. But you know, I learned my second, my third, weren't scary at all. So knowledge. So if I always say, you know, just don't do anything. Give yourself a good six months to even a year. What what I did is I made some really stupid decisions after my divorce. And I thought, I'm not going to do that anymore. I'm going to give myself a year to educate myself. Now, it doesn't need to take a year, but it took me a year. I was really scared. But give yourself time to learn, to talk, to read, to, you know, learn, go to classes, do that. And, and then it's not as scary. Then it's not as scary. And you go and you do small steps, you take small steps and you get lots of support and you get a really good, if it feels right to find a really good financial advisor that you trust. I like that you said, if it feels right. Because some people like to do it on their own. Yeah. Not me, not me. Uh, uh-uh. I don't trust myself to do it on my own. I don't. So, yeah. 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 That makes sense. Um, Ignorance creates fear. I really like that. And it's that slowly undoing that slowly learning. And I think that's powerful. What is your favorite thing about money? My favorite thing about money is it gives me choices. It gives me choices. Money, money gives me choices. If I want to go somewhere or do something, I can do it. If I don't have enough, I know I can save for it and then I can do it. So that's what I love about money. And I can use my money to make a difference. I mean, it feels really good to my daughter for her birthday. She wanted to go to this. She's been having some health issues and she wanted to go to this conference that focuses on her health issues, but it was very expensive. I paid for her to go. I paid for her flight. I paid for the conference. Oh my God. Do you know how good that makes me feel? Yeah. It's stuff like that. Yeah. 
So powerful. And that is something that I hear from women a lot too. I can't afford to leave. We can't afford to get a divorce. So they're, so really you're trapped in a toxic marriage. You're raising your kids in a bad situation because you can't afford it. So I love how you just say, yeah, it's a choice. Once you get knowledgeable about money and the fear goes away and you start making it, you have the choice to either get counseling and maybe stay if that's what you want or to divorce and to leave if that's what you want. And to help your kids, whether it's private school or just buying them healthy food, choice. But I understand that feeling of feeling trapped. I understand that because it's not about, because when people say, I don't, I can't live because of the money, it's never about money. When people say it's, it's never about the money, it's about the fear of the unknown. That's what it was for me. That's what it is for most. It's the fear of the unknown. And the thing is, our brain, it, it's, it's almost like we can't help it because our brain was designed from the beginning of time, millions of years ago. Our brain had one purpose and it still does. Our brain's only purpose is to make sure we survive, that we stay alive. Yeah. yeah. And so whenever we enter the unknown, the unpredictable, the unfamiliar, our brain feels threatened. We feel threatened. And our thinking brain shuts down. We go into fight, flight, or freeze. And we feel trapped. And that's why it's so important, if you can at all swing it, to get some counseling, to get some therapy. Because it's really hard when your brain is wired for safety and you're so scared. And it's not your fault if you can't leave. You're absolutely right. Absolutely right. It's not your fault, but the help is what gets you to that next level. Exactly. 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 And if there's any, any, any kind of abuse going on, whether it's physical, emotional, or financial, because there is a thing of financial abuse, which you know about, it's important to call the domestic abuse hotline that, that really get help. It's free. Let's talk a little bit about financial abuse, because I'm thinking some listeners might be saying, wait, financial abuse? I wonder if I'm experiencing that. Can you say more about that? If you wonder, you probably are. <laughs> if you wonder, <laughs> you probably are. It, financial abuse is when you're, you can't leave be, because of the money, but your husband or partner is either keeping secrets not letting you have access to the cards, puts everything in her or his name, uh, lies to you. I had all of that. I had a total financial abuse and it's a real thing. It is a real thing. And I want to tell you, you cannot handle this alone. This is where you need help. I remember there was a national, there was a, Allstate had a program, their found, Allstate Foundation did a program on financial abuse to help yeah. uh, and so we, I went, traveled all over the country talking about financial abuse. And it's a real thing. And it's serious. It's just a serious. And that's what keeps people, usually keeps women in violent or unhealthy situations. So get help. You cannot do this on your own. You cannot. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. Because it's like the fish in water. You oftentimes cannot see your own environment because it's your own environment. You're, you, you cannot see. And you're so traumatized. Usually at that point, you're so traumatized that you cannot, you cannot think clearly. You cannot. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's, that's what I love about, you know, the work that you do where it, it talks about the, the inner work, because that is part of it. Getting yourself out of the state of fight, flight, or freeze, healing that trauma, getting the help, separating yourself, having that new perspective owning who you can be and what it might look like and slowly stepping into that so your outer world can change. And then at the same time, having that ability to dream about all these amazing things you can do, that high level work, even though you might not be able to get there next week or next month, holding that vision is so powerful in recreating your identity and your view of yourself. Yes. And if anybody's in the throes, of betrayal and abuse, it's really hard to think, to create that vision. It's really hard. 
I get it. I get it. That's why I, I just can't say enough about getting help, about getting help, getting help. And just being part of your group. I mean, that's, that's a beautiful way of reaching out and getting help. Just that, getting that yeah. support. Yes, be because- a game changer. Exactly. Yeah, because sometimes I think the most powerful thing that I say to women sometimes is it's okay that you don't know what you want right now. It's okay that you can't cook or you can't get out of bed. It's okay. You're normal. It's normal to not be able to just leap up and recreate your whole life tomorrow. You're normal. Yeah, you're normal. That's right. You just, it's a, it's a time to heal. Yes. It's a time to heal. Yeah. That's what this is. Yeah. And you know, you had commented on my boa. I, I for, for listeners who are just listening, I always keep a boa on my chair. As the reminder, the analogy that I always use is burlesque. You take off layer by layer by layer to get to that <laughs> golden heart that's inside. And it's not about just ripping everything off and doing all the work. It's about you take off the jacket and then you get comfortable with the blouse. Then you take off the blouse and you get comfortable with the corset and it's slowly layer by layer to find that golden heart, that golden center that is inside all of us. Oh, Laura, I love you. That is a great, <laughs> that is a great analogy. Oh my God. I love it. <laughs> Thank you. It's so true though. It's just so true. And I think one of the golden hearts, the golden centers that you talk about is legacy building. You know, what is your legacy that it's not just about you, it's that legacy. And that's definitely high level stuff. But I'd like to talk about, you know, we talked about the levels and getting to abundance, but beyond abundance, there's wealth and there's legacy. Say more about that. And when does that come in? And, and what, should, what should we just think about when we think about legacy? Well, Legacy, thinking about legacy comes in as the healing progresses. You know, it's like, it's hard to think past your own pain when you know that, you and I both know that. Oh yeah. So, but legacy comes in when you start really feeling like asking yourself, how do I want to be remembered after I'm gone? What is the mark I want to make on this world? And it could be something big and it could be something really small. I remember I had a woman in one of my retreats and she was building schools in Rwanda and she was sure that was her legacy she wanted to leave. And she had a heart attack and she almost died. And she realized, oh yeah, I love building schools, but my legacy is how I want my children and my grandchildren to remember me the kind of woman, that's what really, she realized that was her highest value. And so the legacy is how you want to be remembered. And it's so interesting. You want to hear a great story? I yes. Love story. So you know who Alfred Nobel is, right? Yeah. So he, you know how he got his, he won his fortune. He's a very wealthy industrialist, 1900s. I have no idea, actually. He invented dynamite and he started making, uh, he started, he manufactured weapons of war. And one day his, his brother died and he was reading, looking at the paper and they had, you saw the obituary that wasn't for his brother. It was mistakenly for him. And he saw what was written and it was, what was written is they called him a doctor of death. Uh, mass destruction, the merchant of death, they called him. And he thought, that's not how I want to be remembered. And he invented wow. the Nobel Peace Prize. And that, because that, he, that's, he thought, what is the legacy I want to leave? It's not about death. It's about peace. Mm. And so that's the question to ask. If I was on my deathbed, how would I want to be remembered? Wow. That's a powerful catalyst for getting through infidelity as well. How do I want to be remembered at the end of this? Yeah, there is a life. And, and for me, both of divorces were crushing, absolutely crushing, and were 
life altering in the best way ever. In the yeah. best way ever. Yes. I have thanked both my exes. Thank them genuinely and sincerely for screwing me over. Yes. <laughs> if it wasn't for that, I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing today. Yeah. Living your legacy. Living my legacy. Living yeah. my legacy. Yeah. So because do you, yeah. yeah, I love that. So do you have, because I've got my legacy in a sentence that I try to keep front and center in my brain, just to get me going through, keep me going through all those tough times. Do you have your legacy and are you willing to share that? Do you have that in a what, sentence? What, what is yours, Laura? What is yours? Mine is, I want to be remembered as a powerful force for good. Mm. Um, I, that's beautiful. Thank you. I want, I want to be remembered by anyone who came across my path that their world was better because of that. So it's kind of very same. Yeah, it is. And I like that. I really like that because for yours and for mine, my intention was it's impacting my children, my family, my friends, the world. It's, I want to keep abroad, but I want to be powerful and I want to be a force for good. And those are my two mm -hmm. legacy pieces. Yeah. And my other one, which I don't often talk, well, I'm talking about more and more now, is that I want people to, I want women to understand that wealth building is a spiritual practice. Oh, and it is. It can be. It can be. I love that. Thank you for sharing that. So, Barbara Dash Houston is your website. I'll put that in the show notes. Is there anywhere else you would like to direct listeners to where they can learn more about you or your books or your work? I think that's the best place. Yeah, that's the best place. Thank you. Perfect. Well, Barbara, thank you so much. I, I feel like this was a very rich conversation that will bless listeners, you know, with, with mm. the gift of insight and understanding. I think you are a very good role model, both personally and professionally. Mm, and I thank you. you for that. Thank you. Thank you. I, I really love talking to you. Thank you. Likewise. Great energy. You have great energy. Thank you so much. Thank you. Listeners, be sure to check out Barbara, her work and her books. I highly recommend them all. Have an amazing week. And as usual, Always remember to flaunt exactly who you are, because who you are is more than enough. This podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp. Have you been struggling lately? Relationship issues impact every area of your life. When I found out about my husband's infidelity, I was so devastated. I could barely function. Sleeping was impossible because I couldn't shut off my brain. Eating was a challenge because I felt nauseous all the time, and for the first month or so, everything felt pointless. Whether you're having trouble sleeping, feeling hopeless, or just can't focus, BetterHelp is here to help you. BetterHelp offers licensed therapists who are trained to listen and help. You can talk to your therapist in a private online environment at your convenience. There's a broad range of expertise in BetterHelp's 20,000 plus therapist network that gives you access to help that might not be available in your area. Just fill out a questionnaire to help assess your specific needs, and then you'll be matched with a therapist in under 24 hours. And then you can schedule secure video and phone sessions. Plus, you can exchange unlimited messages, and everything you share is completely confidential. I know that confidentiality was important for me, especially early on when I couldn't even get my own mind wrapped around what was happening. And it was so comforting to be able to speak with someone candidly about everything I was going through to validate that what I was feeling and experiencing was completely normal. You can request a new therapist at no additional charge anytime. Join the 2 million plus people who have taken charge of their mental health with an experienced better help therapist special offer to flaunt create a life you love after infidelity and betrayal listeners you get 10 percent off your first month at betterhelp.com slash flaunt that's better help h-e-l-p dot com slash flaunt f-l-a-u-n-t thanks again to better help 
for sponsoring this podcast. Tune in next time to Flaunt. Find your sparkle and create a life you love after infidelity or betrayal with radio host and live choreographer Laura Cheadle every Wednesday at 7 a.m. and 7 p.m. Eastern Time on syndicated Dream Vision 7 Radio Network. Develop naked self-worth and reclaim your confidence, enthusiasm, and joy so you can create a life you love and embrace who you are today. Download your free Sparkle Through Betrayal Recovery Guide at NakedSelfWorth.com. 